everyone. I think we're going to get the recording started here. Yep, and, okay, perfect. Thank you, Cam. Wonderful. All right, good afternoon. My name is Sarah Grant, uh, representing the city and county of Broomfield, and I am the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. Call to order the October 23rd, 2023 Dr. Cog TAC meeting at 1.31 p.m. This is an in-person and live stream meeting format. Members of the public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. Those attending online, please make sure that your name is, uh, types your first and last name as well as your representation. We ask those uh, that are intending to speak to use the raise hand button to ask a question or comment on an agenda item. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the chat box. Again, please use the raise hand to ask any questions or comment on agenda items. Reminder, during the business agenda, only TAC members and alternates can speak or ask questions. Members of the public may speak during public comments. Um, oops, sorry, my script here. Um, <clears throat> For those here in person, please press the unmute button at the bottom of your mic. It currently should be red and it will uh, light, unlight itself for you to speak. Please speak directly into the microphone so your voice will amplify and please announce your name and representation when asking a question or making a comment for the record. Uh, Dr. Cog is sending around the sign-in sheet, so please sign in. And at this time, TAC members and alternates here in person will introduce themselves. Um, We'll start here, Ms. DeAndre. Ms. Maria DeAndre, City of Wheat Ridge. Christina Lane, Jefferson County. Larry Simmons, Little Help. Mary, City of. Rachel Halte, non motorized special interest. Carson Priest, TDM, non motorized. Brian Soderland, City of Littleton. Larry Nimmo, Douglas County, City of Castle Pines. Jeff Dankenbring, representing Arapahoe County from the City of Centennial. Kent Mormon, Adams County, City of Thornton. Don Ferruzzi, City of Arvada. Matt Callison, City of Aurora, Arapahoe County. Frank Bruno, via Mobility Services. Jeff Boyd, Housing Special Interest Seat. Pam Kennedy, Dr. Cog staff. Sarah Grant, City and County of Broomfield. Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog staff. Ron Papsdorf, Dr. Cog. Mike Silverstein, Regional Air Quality Council. Jordan Rudel, CDOT Region 1. Marissa Gahan, CDOT Division of Transportation Development. In Sanson, City of Boulder. Bill Soroy, RTD. David Gasper, City and County of Denver. Jennifer Bartlett, City and County of Denver. At WMP, uh, City of Golden, Jefferson County. Uh, Justin Schmitz, representing Douglas County with City of Lone Tree. Brian Weimer, Rappo County. Lauren Kurgis, Dr. Cogstaff. Cody Ayers, Aviation Special Interest. And Rick Pilgrim, Environmental Special Interest. Great, thank you everybody. This time I'll hand it over to Jacob Breaker for a few announcements. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we need to say both hello and goodbye at this meeting. So let's say hello back to Hillary Simmons. Uh, welcome back, glad to have you. And we need to say goodbye and acknowledge um, all the great contributions of Rachel Haltine with Bicycle Colorado. This is her last meeting. Uh, we're really, really sad to lose you, Rachel, but we're so grateful for everything that you've done um, in your current role for TAC, for Dr. Cog, and for the region. So I want to acknowledge your service and say thank you. And then one other announcement. Um, you will notice on your agenda that we've identified the next meeting as December 4th. So we wanted to call that out. After today's meeting, we'll send out a calendar invite so that you have that. Uh, but we've essentially either combined November and December or canceled November and moved up December, however you want to look at it. Uh, but instead of meeting, I think, November 27th and December 18th, we're going to combine those into a December 4th meeting. So just wanted to flag that. And again, a calendar invite uh, will come from CAM after this meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Ms. Hiltine, and welcome back, Ms. Simmons. Uh, now we will open the meeting for public comment. Public comment is limited to three minutes, and as a reminder, after public comment, only TAC members and alternates will partake in the discussion regarding each agenda item. 
If you've joined by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we'll call on you uh, to begin speaking. If you join by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we'll call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and then you'll need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You'll have three minutes to speak in which you will be asked to wrap up and your line will be muted. As a reminder to everyone, after public comment, only TAC members and alternates may be partake in the discussion. Do we have any public comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, give it a second, but I don't see any hands raised online or in person. Thank you. At this time, we'll move on to um, the meeting summary from the September 25th, 2023 TAC meeting. Um, please let me know if there's any discussion, corrections, or questions regarding the meeting summary. Just one quick note about the meeting summary. Um, like all public agencies in this state, um, we are starting to um, kind of address the requirements of House Bill 1110 related to accessibility and the accessibility of our documents. So um, that's, a, that's a continuous journey that we've already started, we'll continue to be on over the next several months and that manifests itself um, in several ways. And you're gonna start seeing our um, TAC meeting summaries and our agendas start to look just a little bit different. Things like spelling out acronyms, uh, we've changed our agenda letterhead, kind of things like that. So some of it's subtle, some of it's more kind of more obvious, but you'll start seeing that as we go through. And I think you'll be seeing some of that in um, the meeting summary from last meeting and going forward. So just wanted to flag that. Thank you, Mr. Rieger. Um, any question, comments, or discussion on the meeting summary from September? I'm seeing none. Uh, the minutes will stand approved. The meeting summary will stand approved, and we'll move on to the next item. Um, this, uh, this meeting, we have no action items. Um, today, we have uh, several informational briefings. Uh, for the first item is the Transportation Improvement Program Set Aside uh, Program Schedule, Attachment B in your packet. Josh Schwenk, Senior Transportation Planner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so back in August, we did approve a new transportation improvement program. And as part of that, uh, the new tip includes several uh, set-aside programs. So we just wanted to give an overview of those for all of you, um, as well as a brief update on the schedule or anticipated schedule for each of them. Um, so just some context of what we're discussing here. Most of you are very aware of the regional and sub-regional calls for projects. Uh, honestly, probably a little bit sick of them after the past year and a half back-to-back um, -back calls. Uh, but we do have some additional funding opportunities for you. So before we held those calls for projects, some funding was taken off the top from the pool of funding available. It was set aside, as the name implies, uh, for several programs that we have, um, several of which include their own solicitations. So the current set-asides in the new uh, TIP document are here on your screen. Um, before you get too concerned about the complicated structure, basically these seven red boxes are what we're discussing. Um, they're essentially each their own independent programs. Um, the air quality improvements one is just a little bit different. That funding goes straight to the Regional Air Quality Council. Uh, there's generally not a solicitation to local agencies for that funding. Um, so just running quickly through the anticipated schedule, I will just note um, this is our, our best estimate of when these application calls for projects or letter of interest solicitations will be occurring. Um, it is always subject to change, um, but as of right now, this is when we anticipate them. Um, so starting at the top with human service transportation, that generally occurs annually every winter. Um, the Regional Transportation Operations and Technology actually just wrapped up a call for projects, but anticipates going out again um, spring of 2026. Transportation Demand Management uh, is looking, well, actually also just wrapped up um, a call for projects a few months ago. Uh, they are looking at spring of 2025 for their next solicitation. Um, these next four, I will amend my earlier caveat to just say these are, are new programs, so 
take these dates with an extra grain of salt. We are trying, still trying to set them up, um, get everything contracted. So there, there could be some flexibility in these dates. Um, but Innovative Mobility is looking at this coming spring, um, as well as summer of 2025. Community-based transportation planning, you'll actually be hearing about um, later in this meeting. They are looking at opening very soon um, and then holding an additional solicitation uh, in 2025. Livable Centers is looking at uh, early in the spring of this coming year, as well as another one um, in summer of 2024, as well as potentially another one in 25. And then corridor planning, um, another one that recently wrapped up a solicitation uh, looking at their next one in summer of 25. So just running through each of those programs just for a little more info on what each of them entails. Um, Human Service Transportation or HST uh, that really looks at um, mobility options for older adults, people with low income, veterans, people with disabilities. An interesting thing with this is we're able to actually combine the funding through the TIP with a couple other sources, so Section 5310 funding through the Federal Transit Administration as well as Older Americans Act funding that comes through our Area Agency on Aging. Uh, just provide some additional funding for these projects. Uh, we hold a kind of combined super call so you don't need to look at which specific funding source you're applying for. Um, and just some examples of projects that have recently been funded under the HST set aside. Um, you'll see some vehicle purchases, either replacements or fleet expansions, some mobility management type projects as well as operating expenses. And you'll see the sponsors are a mix of local agencies as well as some um, nonprofit service providers. So for Regional Transportation Operations and Technology, or RTO&T, um, this is really looking at implementing our new Regional Transportation Operations Strategic Plan, um, really looking at traffic operations around the region, um, ensuring interconnectivity and efficient operations. Um, this, uh, and actually, the, uh, the note at the bottom was there just because these were approved uh, last week by our board. Um, but these are our new set of recent RTO&T projects. Um, so you'll see a mixture, but um, everything from traffic management center, signal equipment, um, detection devices, cameras, um, all sorts of things. Um, you'll notice the sponsors here are primarily local public agencies. Uh, for transportation demand, excuse me, transportation demand management or TDM, um, this is really looking at marketing and outreach around TDM strategies to reduce single occupant vehicle travel. Um, so again, these are our recent awards uh, to give you an idea of some examples. Um, again, a mix, uh, everything from shuttle service uh, to um, an expansion of the Viva Streets program that had opened up Broadway to bikes and pedestrians recently. And you'll notice the sponsors here are primarily our transportation management associations in the region. Um, so our new set-asides, um, you don't need to know this acronym, but we call them the CLIP set-asides just to note uh, the four programs. The main thing with these is that they are using a new format. Um, the idea here is rather than awarding funding directly to local sponsor agencies in the region, uh, Dr. Cog would remain the project sponsor. So essentially the funding would come to us, but we would work with stakeholders throughout the region to implement these projects. Um, the idea there is just to hopefully leverage some efficiencies um, rather than having contracting for each individual project and hopefully um, be able to facilitate some projects that are either multi-jurisdictional or involve some uh, regional issues where local agencies may not know where to get started. Um, so the first of these is our community-based transportation planning set aside. Again, you'll hear more about this later on your agenda, but this is really looking at historically marginalized communities in the region and working directly with those communities uh, to solve some of their uh, challenges. Um, most recently, uh, we've piloted a couple of these, um, looking at access to some elementary schools in Edgewater, as well as a study on North Federal Boulevard in Westminster. So our innovative mobility set aside, this is brand new, has not been piloted yet, um, but it's looking at um, really emerging technology, um, innovative solutions um, around issues throughout the region. 
Um, so we don't have any examples for this one yet, um, but here's kind of some general topic areas that we would expect to see addressed. Um, everything from curbside management, um, emerging mobility modes, connected vehicles, um, mobility data. So our livable center small area planning, this is another brand new one, um, looking at the connection between land use and transportation throughout the region, really focusing on kind of um, activity centers or community nodes um, and access to those. Um, again, we don't have any example projects since this is a new program, um, but here are kind of some uh, general topic areas that we would expect to be addressed. Um, these will also probably um, follow a theme uh, with each solicitation. So with the first, um, likely looking at um, some implementation strategies around our greenhouse gas mitigation action plan. Um, and then also in the future, looking at our housing needs assessment and maybe some of the outcomes of that. And finally, we have our corridor planning set aside. Um, so this is looking at some of those major um, arterial corridors identified in the regional transportation plan and really looking at how to move those forward um, to the next step of implementation. Um, and the most recent ones that were piloted um, and these well, actually, excuse me, um, these were actually uh, the first corridors selected under the new set aside rather than the pilot. These were also selected last week. Um, so these would be the Sheridan corridor um, as well as the East Colfax BRT extension. So again, just to recap, um, just want to provide the schedule again um, so you all can see it. Uh, most likely, these are the dates that we are shooting for, but we will have a schedule available online as well that will be updated um, regularly with the most up-to-date information. Um, and again, that is the web address. Um, it's not the easiest, um, but uh, on that website, you can find uh, the full policy that includes all the details about each of the individual set-aside programs. There's kind of a quick one-page handout, so if you're not sure which program might be the best for you, you can kind of compare and contrast them, as well as, as I mentioned, kind of the updated schedule information. Um, if you have any questions about any of these programs, each of them does have a separate staff uh, set-aside manager that you can reach out to. Um, you can see those here. Uh, if you're not sure who to reach out to, you can always reach out to me and I can direct you um, to the most relevant staff. Um, so with that, happy to take any questions. Um, if it's a specific question about a specific program, I might have to reach out to one of those uh, specific set-aside managers and get back to you, but uh, happy to try. Thank you, Mr. Schwenk. Do you have any questions or comments for Dr. Cog? Mr. Weimer. So this may be something that you can't answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So you're doing some housing assessments, correct, uh, with regard to uh, housing needs and stuff, and Dr. Cog's taking that over. My question is, how are you integrating um, what counties have to do as part of their HUD programs in their housing assessments, and how does that integrate together? And how are you taking that information? Can anybody answer that one? Since it's not transportation directly related. Madam Chair. Mr. Papster. Um, thanks, Brian. Appreciate the question. It is a, uh, not, a, not an easy answer. It's a complicated question, complicated answer. So you're right. Um, at the request of our board of directors, Dr. Cog is embarking on a regional housing assessment and planning effort um, as a logical outgrowth from a lot of the debate that occurred earlier this year at the state legislature around statewide housing policy and um, mandates for um, local housing policies through legislation that ended up not getting enacted into law. Um, so our board asked us to do sort of a regional assessment to help inform future discussions and help this region wrap its arms around that very complicated issue and see if we can come to the table forward with some ideas that our local governments could agree on that would help address the regions and the state's housing needs. 
Um, your specific question about how it relates to any specific requirements that counties have under HUD regulations, I'm assuming, and some cities, I'm assuming, as a result of being recipients of CDBG funds. Um, I, I don't know. I do know that our staff that's leading up the regional housing assessment has been reaching out to local agencies to get existing housing assessments and housing plans that exist. Um, if you have a particular staff person um, at the county that you'd like um, our staff to reach out to, please let me know and I'll pass that along to our folks in the regional planning and development division that are leading up the housing assessment work. Yeah, we can do that and I just there's a timing issue there and if it's going to be utilized from the standpoint of what you're going to be making allocations for kind of what was identified up here I think that would be helpful because I know some of the jurisdictions are actually doing those assessments now and I'm not sure of the timing as it relates to theirs versus yours and how those interact so that's the purpose of my question. Oh, that's really that's really helpful, Brian. And again, just let me know who who to get um, our folks in touch with um, at the at the county because it, it is really important. They're they're working really hard to reach out to the appropriate staff at local agencies, cities, and counties and towns. Um, again, gathering information about existing housing assessment work that's been done, but not every jurisdiction has done those um, to at least help inform our process. This process is moving pretty quickly. We're hoping to have sort of at least an initial sort of high level needs assessment done uh, by about January, but the regional, the full regional housing assessment and any associated sort of strategies that come out of that won't be completed until next. Uh, Mr. Gaspers. Question on, on the, I guess the process with the uh, clip set asides with Dr. Cog remains the project sponsor and the funding is not being awarded to the individuals, but just the process of how that's actually going to work and like the letter of interest. I mean, is, can you walk us through that a little bit more? Yeah, um, I can uh, get started on that. Um, so we've actually piloted this. Uh, this approach through our community-based uh, transportation planning and corridor planning. Um, but essentially, the um, Dr. Cog would be the project sponsor. Um, we would hold a solicitation wherein um, interested stakeholders would submit kind of a letter of interest of the project idea, um, their interest in being involved with that. Um, but rather than actually being awarded those funds, those funds would remain with Dr. Cog, who would kind of um, coordinate um, with those stakeholders on that project. Um, Jacob, did you want to provide some additional details? Yeah, no, I think that's a good answer. I think all I'd add to that is just, you know, the idea here, the concept behind it is rather than making yet more awards and sort of individual, you know, little awards around the region for things that you all have to turn around and manage by retaining the funds, we can actually be a better partner in a sense and actually take a more active role, kind of help you all take some of that administrative burden, some of the resource burden off of you in both the corridor and community planning work that we've piloted so far. Really what we're asking for is just staff time and commitment from local governments. But, you know, the funds administration, the contracting, the things that kind of go with that, we've kept that, again, to try and make it easier for the locals so that we can focus, you know, these limited but important resources on the work that we're trying to do under each of these set-asides. David, does that answer your question? Yeah, it, it does. I guess maybe I was more interested in the, the letter of intent or interest, I guess, or like, do you actually express interest in a specific, just a, a, a general idea, a project concept, or is there something more? Yeah, so again, with, available. oh, sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. Um, sorry, with um, four clip set-asides, right, Josh? So two of them we've piloted, two of them are going to be brand new. So each one might be a little bit different in that respect, but at least so far, the way it's worked is that we've asked for specific proposals. We've asked for very specific things, whether it's a corridor or a specific sort of community for the community planning, you know, a specific issue. Um, and we've used the letter of interest approach because we're finding that really helpful to help you all kind of shape your ideas and kind of maximize the opportunities under a particular um, funding source or under a particular set aside. So. I believe that we're probably going to continue that approach in some way. It might look a little bit different in each set aside, but yeah, the idea is starting with that letter of interest to help define that idea um, and then going forward into a full selection from there. 
Uh, does that ring true from an overall tip perspective? Yeah, I think that follows um, kind of how we have the process outlined in the set aside policy. Um, some of those, as Jacob mentioned, will be a little bit different. Um, so for instance, for corridors, since those are specifically looking at the corridors identified in the regional transportation plan, um, that's been kind of by invite. Um, staff has kind of reached out to um, stakeholders along those corridors and asked if there is interest um, in having corridor plans for those. Um, so as these programs develop, there might be other instances like that where it's a little bit um, a little bit different, but in general, that is the process that we want to follow. Ms. DeAndrea? Yeah, and then, so just logistically, Dr. Cog would be the, would manage the contract with, for whatever the outcome or that ultimate deliverable would be? Yeah, that's correct. Now we do that, of course, in partnership with the stakeholders in a particular kind of corridor study or community study or whatever the set aside is. But yes, um, Dr. Cog would manage the, the contract and the consultant. Ms. Sampson. So, um, I have a logistics question too. So the Louisville Center small area planning set aside um, is noted on slide 20 as um, having a request for letters of interest out fall 23. Is that correct? I'm so sorry. Um, yes. I oh, should have noted that. That was a typo that was in your packet. Um, it's been uh, changed here um, on this slide, but I forgot to note that during my presentation. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, yes, the first will likely be um, early in 2024, looking at probably January uh, would be the earliest that that would open. Mr. Papstorf. Thank you. Just, just of additional notes on sort of the administrative questions that have come up and just to highlight a couple of the other reasons why we did that and we, we, we talked about this with the committee as we were adopting the tip and establishing those set asides um, but two key things one is by um, Dr. Cog sort of being the grant recipient for those set aside programs we have negotiated with CDOT and CDOT has agreed to allow us to use state toll credits for the match so in the past for our set aside programs and for some of our other set aside programs where we're basically allocating grants to local government recipients, you all were responsible for the non federal match for those projects. In this case, since we're sort of lumping a number of projects together under a broader category, CDOT has agreed to allow us to use state toll credits for that non federal match. For, so we're able to leverage the money more directly and relieve local jurisdictions from that match requirement. The other piece is that we're working with CDOT to negotiate basically one grant agreement for each of those set-aside programs. So instead of us awarding a grant to each to individual jurisdictions and then you all negotiating that grant agreement with CDOT and putting more administrative burden on CDOT, we're working towards um, one grant agreement between Dr. Cog and CDOT for each of those each of those programs. So again, addressing some of those administrative issues. And then lastly, I think particularly for the corridor planning work, you know, the corridors that we think are appropriate for this program are the ones where doc it's in Dr. Cog's lane as a convener, right? These are big, complex, multi-jurisdictional corridors. We don't, we don't typically, we're not really looking to use that co this corridor planning process where Dr. Cog would play more of a lead role in coordination with local governments to sort of do a pretty small corridor that's sort of just in one jurisdiction, right? That That's not really our role that's more appropriate for a local jurisdiction, but a big core that spans multiple jurisdictions, maybe it's a state highway that spans multiple jurisdictions, that's kind of where we're, what we're looking at. Any additional questions or comments? Thank you, Mr. Schwenk and Dr. Cogstaff. Thank you for providing this overview and schedule and detailed information. We look forward to more calls for projects. Thank you. Uh, next item of the informational briefings is item number five, the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan Cycle Amendment. This is attachment C in your packet. Um, and I have Alvin Badal Sanchez, Regional Transportation Planning Program Manager for this agenda item. Thank you.
one now. Ooh, there we go. All right. Uh, so I don't have a formal presentation before y'all. It'll just be the information provided in the memo packet as well as the map that's provided in the packet. But staff wanted to provide you an update with the requests that we received through our 2024 cycle amendments and then just give you a heads up about what the next steps look like on our end to move forward towards an April adoption of our amended 2050 RTP. So during the call, we did receive six amendments. Those are listed on the screen in the memo packet. I will note that we did receive a seventh amendment after the deadline had passed, but after staff reviewed it, we determined that it wasn't necessary to be in the RTP or considered for inclusion in the RTP. So you're not seeing that seventh one listed. Of the six projects, four are requests for new projects. One is a request for a scope change, and then one is a request to move the staging period that it's identified in, in the plan. I'll just run through each of these real quick and then happy to answer any questions that y'all might have on next steps um, or projects if, if needed. Um, so the City of Boulder is requesting to uh, stripe and sign new bat lanes on Colorado 7 from 28th to 63rd. Commerce City has three requests in, one for a new project along 96th Avenue from I-76 to Hines. That would widen it from two to four. The second project is for a scope change along 120th Avenue, uh, changing the widening that is shown in the plan from four lanes to six lanes. And then the third request is a staging period revision, moving the project that is currently listed in the 2040 to 2050 staging period into the current 2020 to 2029 staging period. City of Lone Tree has requested a new project at Havana and Lincoln that would great separate those two roadways and it's tied to the ongoing interchange work at I-25 and Lincoln Avenue. And then Weld County has also requested a new project at I-76 and Weld County Road 8, the construction of a new interchange that currently doesn't exist at that location. Like I mentioned, uh, we did receive that seventh one that we didn't feel needed to be included or evaluated during the cycle amendments process. Next steps, we're continuing to reach out to project sponsors just to get some extra information, make sure we have everything that we need to make an informed decision on which amendments move forward in the process. We're planning for October through December really to be modeling, network coding, writing the documents. We'd like to have a draft RTP and all of the different appendices done by January. And then public and stakeholder review February through March with the Transportation Commission, the Air Pollution Control Division, our committees, our formal public hearing process. And then we're ultimately aiming for an April board adoption of the amended RTP. Following that, staff will submit it to our federal partners and we'll work to make sure our regional transportation plan and all of those different appendices are also compliant with state accessibility requirements. So those are some of the next steps we're looking at for this process, but we wanted to provide you an update with what we received during this call for amendments um, and see if there are any questions on either the projects or next steps moving forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any questions uh, for Dr. Cog's staff? Mr. Weimer. Although you didn't mention it, I assume that part of the analysis will include the greenhouse gas plan, and uh, I would assume that that's part of all these projects that you're looking for, how that integrates with that, correct? Correct. Uh, even for an amendment cycle, we do still meet all of our federal requirements, so we still will be doing state greenhouse gas emission reduction requirements modeling along with our federal air quality conformity. Uh, while it isn't a project-based analysis, we do, still do look at the full network uh, during an amendment cycle to make sure it's in compliance. Mr. Mormon? Are all of these projects moved to the 2020-2030 the, the or some? Um, I would have to double check. I do believe all are requested in the 2020 to 2029 staging period. Um, so yes, the current staging period. Um, some, as we're getting more information, uh, we could just wait to hold until the next major foyer update if that project's gonna be in the 30 to 39 staging period. So that could be part of uh, the information just that we're taking into consideration when it comes time to, comes time to determine what's included in the amendments that are moved forward. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions? Thank you, Mr. Sanchez. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to item number six in your packet. This is the 2023 Active Modes Crash Report. Uh, and Aaron Villery, uh, Senior Active Transportation Planner, uh, will present this item. Thank you.
Right. Hello. It sounds okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is Aaron Villery. I'm the Senior Active Transportation Planner here at Dr. Cog. This is my first time presenting to this group, so I'm delighted to be here today. Um, and I wanted to talk about the active modes crash report um, that we have included in packets and are um, uh, thrilled to present to you. So um, the active modes crash report um, is a report on bicycle and pedestrian um, and uh, scooter crashes over a five-year period between uh, 2019. Um, this uses regional crash data that we received from the state um, and then Dr. Cog curates and we can use for analysis. Um, this is an update. There are, our previous crash report uh, uh, was part of the active transportation plan uh, adopted in 2019, and that covered 2011 to 2015 data. Um, so this is an update to that report to um, uh, study the tr crash trends and causes um, of, of recent uh, active mode crashes in the region. Uh, but before we uh, really dig in, I want to start with this window over the last decade preceding it. So starting at 2010, um, consistent with national trends, uh, there's been a pretty uh, fast uptick um, in uh, uh, fatal and severe injury crashes uh, regionally and nationally. Um, and specifically, pedestrian fatal and severe injury crashes between 2010 and 2019 uh, went up about 42%. Um, motorized uh, fatal and severe injury crashes went up as well, and then bicycling involved crashes are more complicated. But I wanted to call this out as sort of the, the, the driving reason behind uh, the importance of this report, um, that this is, this is both a national and regional trend and something that I think a lot of uh, us are focused on. Uh, just to put a little more context, so sort of since the, the Great Recession of that period, uh, pedestrian involved fatal and severe injury crashes in the region have gone from about 200 to about 285 uh, in, in 2019, and so that's about a 42% a uh, increase. Um, sort, of, sort of show you that, uh, that increase. Bicycle involved crashes, uh, this is a little more complex of a picture. You can sort of see it's following that, that increase in trend uh, between 2010 and 2014. And then uh, fatal and severe injury crashes actually start to tick down a little bit. Um, it's a fairly small sample size. So we want to be careful about drawing too many conclusions with this. Um, but they actually do start to decrease. And we don't, uh, we don't think that this is because of a decrease in ridership necessarily. We think that there's some. Um, but uh, just to really focus in on that analysis window between 2015 and 2019, uh, bicycle and pedestrian involved crashes uh, were about 3% of crashes regionally, but about 22% of fatal and severe injury crashes. Um, this is familiar to, I think, a lot of us. Uh, people who are bicycling and walking um, don't have vehicle design to protect them, so we often see outsized impacts. Um, in the event of crashes, that those are more likely to be catastrophic. And so this is a, um, because they're overrepresented among crashes, this sort of makes the case for additional focus. Um, as um, and just something that underlies all of this is that speed really amplifies crash severity. And so when we looked at regional crashes, what we found is that among people walking, among crashes involving pedestrians, uh, where posted speed uh, was 35 miles an hour or greater, um, those crashes were tw uh, uh, twice as light or two times as likely to result in a fatality or severe injury as at a 20 mile per hour speed. Um, for crashes involving bicyclists, um, when you cross that 35 mile per hour threshold, they're about 50% more likely to um, result in a fatality or severe injury. So we really see the way that that uh, speed, you know, increases physical force and uh, in in impact of these crashes. So as we, as we did this report, the, thing I, um, the way that we structured this uh, was really to, to try to use our position as, as a regional planning agency to, to think about um, how we could add uh, to the safety work that you are all doing. So we really wanted to study, rather than saying that these are the high crash corridors, Dr. Cog has a high injury network, uh, many of your jurisdictions um, have a high injury network or a set of high crash corridors, we wanted to really understand those underlying causes. And so we're really focusing on two uh, primary uh, concepts, which is who is involved um, and what are those specific factors about identity or about um, uh, where one lives um, that might influence uh, crash risk. And then where did the crash occur? And so this is getting into those, those sort of design and 
actual factors of land use, of location on the street, the type of street, the type of intersection, um, and the pre-crash maneuvers that are really um, fueling crashes. And so that's the way that the report is organized. Um, as you dig into it, is, is we're really looking into these socio-demographic factors, and then we're looking um, at these, these larger uh, contextual factors. Um, and so the way that this is going to work, uh, rather than, than taking you through the entirety of the report, which I encourage you all to read, um, uh, is, is to just kind of popcorn out some of the um, higher level uh, details or findings and, and talk about some of the things that, that jumped out as sort of a sample. Um, so jumping into that first bucket of, of who was involved, um, first we looked at uh, sex designation. So uh, a caveat to this is that uh, prior to 2019, um, the, the state of Colorado didn't offer um, a, a third uh, X sex designation on driver's licenses. So what we saw in the crash data was really male or female. Um, so uh, at the population level, um, if those are roughly equal shares, what we saw is that men uh, were more likely, there were about two thirds of people involved in pedestrian involved crashes and about three quarters of people involved in bicycle involved crashes. Um, the, the bicycle involved uh, crashes tracks with the gender disparity that um, research has found in cycling rates, uh, both nationally and regionally. Um, but the pedestrian involved crashes, um, surprising. I also wanted to look at age uh, because um, we know physiology, physiologically, um, the ability to withstand trauma sort of um, changes over, um, over age and over your life period. And we found that people over the age of 65 were about 52% more likely than people um, aged 20 to 45 to have to, if, when they were involved in crashes for those crashes to result in death. So we do see some increasing risk um, of severity uh, as, as we have uh, uh, get into older adults. And then finally, this one I'm going to scan at a very high level, but I encourage you to, to look into this a little bit more. We use the, the Justice 40 Equitable Transportation Community Indicators, which is similar to Dr. Cog's Equity Index, um, but uh, breaks down some additional factors. And so we use this, this is a spatial um, index of uh, different either um, social factors, um, economic factors, environmental burden, risk of, um, uh, of hazard. Um, uh, and, and we sort of cross-reference those with where crashes were taking place. And we found um, the big takeaway for this is that sort of as you have more um, historically marginalized population, which is to say in census tracts where there's uh, a higher population of people who are either um, scoring higher in social vulnerability, which um, uh, measures sort of, you know, different socioeconomic factors, environmental burden um, measures risk of exposure to environmental um, hazards, and then transportation cost burden is a calculated index of, of how much households spend on transportation. But essentially, as those um, equity indicators increased, so did crash risk. And these are not the three of the same map. These maps all look a little different. So it's not just remapping um, that as these different risk factors uh, increase, so does crash risk. Um, and finally, we looked at uh, uh, in the crash data where drugs and alcohol were suspected and found that in pedestrian crashes, similar to crashes uh, um, of motorized modes of transportation, but a little higher, about one in five uh, involved alcohol uh, or alcohol was suspected and at least one um, person involved in the crash. Um, so something of a, of a takeaway just to eye on. And then to um, talk about the other piece, uh, which is where did crashes occur and what were the contextual factors underlying uh, active mode crashes. So we broke this section out into uh, pedest uh, pedestrian-involved crashes, so crashes involving people walking, and then crashes involving people bicycling. And first we started with where on the street are they taking place. We found um, in pedestrian-involved crashes about across the region about 54 percent uh, occurred at intersection locations, but that, um, that share decreases as you get into more uh, rural land uses. Um, but most crashes uh, involving pedestrians were occurring at intersections, um, a primary conflict point. Um, and so the way that I'm going to show this, there's a lot of detail in this section about uh, types of crashes, trying to assess pre-crash maneuvers. But the big things to take away um, 
a lot of crashes, three quarters of crashes involved either left turns or broadsides. Um, and so a lot of uh, fatal and severe injury crashes involving pedestrians, 41% uh, involved left turns um, and then 38% involved broadside collisions. And so those were, those were the top two crash uh, types. And we also, when we were looking at these um, uh, intersection crashes, we further broke it down by area types um, so we have uh, an area type that was created for the Regional Vision Zero um, uh, plan um, that divides the region into urban, suburban, and rural contexts. And in the, um, uh, in the report, uh, these crash types are broken down by those area types. But specifically, I wanted to call out in the urban areas, um, nearly a third of urban pedestrian crashes occurred at one type of intersection, which was where major arterial and local streets uh, intersect. Um, and so this jumped out because these are locations that are more likely to have permissive movements, that you might have uh, turns taking place um, into wider receiving lanes. Um, and uh, so this is something to call out that, um, that a lot of crashes occurred at this type of intersection. Um, just to jump over to bicycling crashes, more of these, um, about 67%. Um, throughout the whole region occurred at intersections. And again, in the urban area type, um, almost three quarters occurred at intersections. And so the, the bicycle crash conflicts are really happening at the intersection, which is the primary conflict point on the road. Um, and again, there's a lot of information. The most common crash type, again, for bicycle involved crashes uh, included left turns, but in this case, we also found um, in the suburban context, a surprisingly high number involved right turn movements. Um, so this could involve the, the right hook collision um, that, you, that you might think of, but it might also uh, involve a, a right turn across a bicycle travel way. Finally, we, we, we looked at some seasonal factors, and so we looked at hour of day throughout the year. Um, and we found that bicycle crashes are really concentrated to the peak commute hours, um, that they increased in the morning and then in the evenings um, and afternoons. And pedestrian crashes really increased during the afternoon and evening, um, especially when, when lighting conditions uh, in the environment were changing. Um, so just something to, to be aware of. And then we also looked by season throughout the year. Pedestrian crashes actually increase in the fall and winter, um, and then bicycle crashes are, are really um, more concentrated to the summer uh, and fall commute months, as you might So um, really some interesting seasonality uh, to think about as, as we did our next steps. And then finally, one of the things that we wanted to do, um, you'll notice that we stop at 20, or 2019, and the reason we did that is because 2020 and 2021 represent such um, odd years in terms of travel and, um, and uh, movement throughout the region. Um, and also there was a change in the crash report form in, uh, at the end of 2019. Uh, so we, we wanted to uh, use that sort of a preliminary level, um, try to understand what happened in 2020 and 2021. Um, and the top line takeaway um, is that uh, crashes among all types of users uh, rebounded faster in 2021. Um, than they did, than vehicle miles traveled did throughout the region. And so there is something happening in recent years. Um, I think we're all aware of this. Um, we're all thinking about it, but um, it's true for, for people bicycling and walking that, that crashes seem to be coming back faster than, um, than traffic itself is. Um, so that was a very uh, quick um, summary of what's in the, in the report. I encourage you all to, to dig in and read it. Um, and I appreciate your time and uh, am available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Villery. Uh, any questions for Dr. Cog? Mr. Callison. Thank you. Takeaways being measures, trusting programs, projects, Follow-up question, do you have the uh, serious and, and fatality sorted by cities? Or um, so for the, for the first questions about countermeasures, we actually very intentionally chose not to include countermeasures um, in this report because we wanted to just have a baseline of what was in the crash data before we proceeded into that. Uh, we are planning um, 
to uh, update the active transportation plan uh, beginning next year. Um, and so we'll be digging into that with, with this group and uh, with uh, over the, the next year, um, especially. Um, and then broken down by uh, city, we chose not to. Um, we felt that the area types were a little bit more evocative of uh, sort of understanding the crash patterns um, and didn't want to necessarily get into that benchmarking of city did worse or better. You know? so it's, I think this is our, our hope is that this is a tool for understanding common patterns and types and, um, and being a resource for member governments to use. So we, we certainly could produce um, uh, a benchmarking of, of cities, but uh, we wanted to make sure in the crash report that we were really focusing on those causes. I, I would suggest that it, it would be helpful for cities in terms of program development and responses in their community, getting those budgets, getting those resources. So a spiking challenge. Team. Thank you. I've got a couple of things. There are more comments than questions. Um, so first of all, this was really helpful to take a look at and I really appreciate the, the approach to the analysis that was taken. Um, I, I understand why you didn't go past 2019 because the skewed data with, with COVID, but um, having been tracking the last couple of years, um, you know, we have those those off years in 2021, but I think the recent data is is even more alarming and indicative than the analysis you did. Um, a couple of things I just want to call attention to. Uh, the pedest So we've been really closely following the pedestrian trend, which is just extraordinarily alarming. And one of the contributions you, you were looking at pedestrian demographics and data, but um, the the vehicle bloat is contributing to pedestrian fatalities. It's um, not necessarily that we have so many more pedestrians, but the vehicles that are hitting the pedestrians have become much more dangerous, and it's in part because they're bigger and heavier. And both of those contribute both to the difficulty in seeing a pedestrian, and then when they're hit, that it's, it's not just the speed, it's the weight that makes a huge difference. And the vehicle design is actually making the blunt force against a pedestrian much more serious of an injury, like smaller cars are designed almost to hit pedestrians that would hit them lower in the leg and send them up on, whereas now we have these huge vehicles that are hitting blunt force. So, um, so that is not going to change anytime soon. And I'm aiming that specifically because your graphic that you showed with the uh, posted uh, speed and how that translates to uh, fatalities and serious injuries, that's the posted speed, it's not the road design speed. Um, and so we really need to recognize that with the vehicle bloat going on, it's incredibly important that we're designing roads for vulnerable road users. Um, and CDOT is piloting and, and looking to work with mo more local jurisdictions on a program that uh, really looks at moving away from the 85th percentile and allowing um, local jurisdictions to reduce. So I'm mentioning that as one solution to be thinking about. Um, and then November 15th is the deadline for CDOT to submit its vulnerable road user assessment to the FHWA. And they have done an incredibly thorough job of doing a data-driven analysis with like pretty significant equity overlays that is actually mapping where um, data is showing these, these um, are occurring. So local jurisdictions will have that tool available to them uh, within the next month to actually see where where these investments are different because design is keeping people safe. Um, and then the last thing I just want to mention, what this data isn't capturing is the rise of the e-bikes. And with Colorado leading the nation and removing barriers to e-bike riderships and the investments we're making to mode shift e-bikes as an alternative to your car, um, even though in this we're seeing relatively flat data around bicycle um, crashes and, and serious injuries and fatalities, with e-bike riderships who are traditionally people who are less confident on a bike, we're are gonna really, we, we can't lose track of the importance of bikes in the transportation system, especially here in Colorado. So, sorry, it's no questions, it's just my little soapbox that I wanted to share some of that, hopefully it was helpful. No, I appreciate it, and, and if, if I can, I'll make a plug that um, one of the big things that changed that I 
believe I mentioned, but um, in 2020, we fully shift, uh, switched the crash report form, and that collects a lot more uh, of the granular data around vehicle size and help to, to track some of these trends. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Ferguson. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a quick question related to uh, active modes being defined as walking, bicycling, and scooters. Where, were, where does scooters belong in, te in, time, in terms of how the data is captured and, and reported? Yeah, so um, in, the, in the crash report form that, that was used for this analysis, they're uh, essentially classified as pedestrians, um, and, and we chose to keep them with the pedestrian group just so that we had confidence in, in the data. Um, classified as pedestrians uh, vehicle uh, in most cases, but um, so that's, that's where they're included. Again, you know, there, there are a lot of things that happened in 2019 and 2020, um, one of them being the expansion of scooter programs throughout the region. And so I would expect to see a lot more information um, in, in the next iteration of this report. Um, and, and we hope to um, be able to track that trend in, in years to come. Mr. Weimar. Were you able to track the cause of the accident or who was to blame? Um, so you have vehicles, right? And then you have the active user. I think that helps in terms of how are we going to provide mitigation for that, i.e. somebody running across the middle of a and you showed some of that information, right? Where yeah. they're not at an intersection, um, that we might provide different types of mitigation to prevent that from happening versus other things. So do you have that information? Do you have it in the report? How, how did you look at that component? Absolutely. Um, and it, it is, uh, so yes, the short answer is, is yes, we absolutely uh, tried uh, to the extent we could. I, I think the things we really focused on were, were what was the pre-crash maneuver and, and sort of what were the different travel directions to really understand, you know, what, um, so there's, there's some data just captured in the crash report, but to really understand the level of confidence that we felt good with. Um, what was happening leading up to the moment of the crash. There's some limitations with the crash data, um, being able to assign that that more granular, like what's in the narrative, um, and part of this is is also just limited time to look at uh, crashes across the region. But um, to the extent that we could, we we really tried to pull out, you know, what were the the primary pre-crash maneuvers. I would say we don't get to the level of of who is at fault. Um, we sort of wanted to take this filter of of what were what was happening in the moments before to try to understand what are the exacerbating risk factors, um, say, in road design. So, like, the, the one that jumped out to me is um, specifically the, the, the road type around left turn movements. You know, um, we don't always know, like, which direction somebody was turning, but we, we have pretty good confidence to be able to say, um, you know, was this an approach turn versus, um, versus like a broadside crash. And um, so trying to identify some of those causes. And, and so again, there's a lot of detail in the report um, and we really do try to um, shed some light on, on what some of the major conflicts are by area type and by context. I kind of get it. Somewhat, I mean, there may be need to be some context put into the report that if a community is going to start pro providing some mitigation, that they probably need to look at particulars at that location. Absolutely. And, and go into the report. And I don't, I haven't read the report, but that could be a caveat or something in there. Because when we're looking at other types of crashes, that's something that we look at in terms of design and how to mitigate and standing. Can it be mitigated? Is there, what is that cause and why? So absolutely. I just throw that out as a suggestion. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Villery. Um, piggybacking on um, Mr. Weimer's question, um, it seems that careless driving is probably one of a, a common, uh, one of the check marks in the report. Um, 
do we know in the report, is there any indication that may to see, you know, distracted driving or other um, actions that may have led to the collision? And is that being tracked? Yes, um, and, and there is a section on uh, human contributing factors is, is how it's labeled in the report. And um, uh, so there is that data in some of the crash reports. Uh, so we do include that where, where a human factor was assigned to a crash. Um, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you the numbers off the top of my head, but uh, distraction um, was, I believe, in the sort of like top three or four um, among both modes of crashes. Um, but then again, I'm, uh, I don't have that. Oh. Thank you for the clarification that's on there. I suppose it may also be difficult to discern at the moment uh, what actually led to it. So for clarifying what is on those crash reports. Any additional questions or comments for Mr. Villery? Thank you. Thank you for this um, report and tracking um, this very important topic. Appreciate it. Next item on the agenda is item number seven, community-based transportation plan call for letters of interest. This is attachment E in your packet. Nora Kern, a sub-area in project planning program manager. All right, um, so I'm here to talk about one of the new set-asides that Josh kind of gave a good preview for earlier. Um, my name is Nora Kern. I'm the sub-area project planning and program manager and will be the manager for the community-based transportation planning set-aside. So um, kind of just a preview, again, a little bit more detail on the, the schedule that Josh provided, but we are um, planning to have a call for letters of interest here um, towards the end of the year for the community-based transportation planning set aside. Um, for reference, we do intend to, we kind of plan to have about um, $2.5 million available over the four years of the set aside. And we are planning on splitting that roughly into two two-year calls. So we anticipate having a, about one and a quarter million dollars for this next two year set aside. The letters of interest will be due by the end of the year. So December 31st, 2023. Um, we'll then have a selection panel review the letters that we receive um, in, this, in the early new year and then hope to make a selection so that we can kind of get those projects rolling in the second quarter of 2024. And then um, as Josh discussed earlier, we will have a second round for this program with letters of interest likely in summer 2025. So two, two chances for these projects. So the community-based transportation planning set aside is really intended to kind of be a technical assistance program um, to support planning efforts around the region focused on historically underserved communities. So you can see some of the goals here, um, but it's really about expanding access to opportunities for, for people across the region um, and supporting the efforts of our member governments in planning for these folks and, and kind of working with them to develop transportation plans. Um, so what type of plans are eligible? So any type of transportation study or planning effort that's related to historically marginalized communities. So you can see some examples here. It could be sub-area plans. It could be a, a small corridor study. It could be multimodal bike ped plans, safety studies. Um, I don't need to read them all. You can see the list, but we're trying to keep it really broad. Um, the main factor is that we want these studies to be focused on historically underserved communities. And I didn't include a slide on this, but we actually have a pretty, we're trying to keep the definition of historically marginalized communities, trying to keep that broad as well. So this could be a community that's geographic, geographically, um, ugh, geographically defined um, as either low income or communities of color or um, another um, you know, demographic-based analysis. Um, but we're also open to proposals that might look at 
a kind of a subgroup of population. So maybe students who attend public schools within a, a broader community, or maybe, you know, if you're imagining Cherry Creek, you might think that might not be eligible, but if we're focused on maybe the staff um, or, the, or the folks who are riding transit in that community, that might still be an eligible project. So the kind of three key things we're looking to have in all of these studies. First, because we are focused on some, some communities that maybe haven't been centered in, in planning or maybe hard to reach, um, we want to have ex extensive community engagement. And we will work with all the communities in kind of developing what this looks like. It could include working with community-based organizations. It could include focus groups. It include a number of other kind of um, different types of technique, techniques. Um, second, we do really want to kind of focus on um, centering the historically marginalized communities. So in the letter of interest, we'll ask you what community the plan is for. And so we want to kind of keep that as our North Star throughout the planning process. Um, if we are planning for a certain community, we kind of want to make sure they're um, centered and, and if possible at the table throughout the whole process. And then last, we are hoping to kind of have projects that are implementation oriented. So we don't want to just plan for planning's sake. So we're really looking for buy-in from the local jurisdictions that would be implementing projects, um, buy-in from community partners that would be impacted, um, and really kind of helping, helping you all and helping the region come up with some really um, great transportation projects that can be funded um, or implemented in the coming years. So um, who can apply for these, or who can submit a letter of interest, I should say? Um, we are keeping it open to local jurisdictions, regional agencies, and then um, unlike in our pilot, we're actually kind of going to include the nonprofit organizations, which could include TMAs or TMOs as well. The one note is we, because we're trying to keep the project implementation oriented, if a nonprofit or TMO submits a letter of interest, we will require a letter of interest from the impacted jurisdiction, just to make sure there's kind of buy-in from, from all of our local partners. Um, we touched on this a little bit. So this is one of our new format set aside. So the, the roles are slightly tweaked compared to us just handing funds to um, the project sponsors. So Dr. Cog is going to fully fund the studies. There is no local match. So we'll un underline that uh, no local match required. Um, and then as we talked about earlier, we'll manage procurement. Um, including the contract with CDOT for the, for the funds and then service project manager for the study. The project sponsor, um, a couple things, kind of main things we require. First is we are going to ask all project sponsors to submit a, kind of a letter of understanding and project commitment, saying they're aware of what we expect of them and, and that there's buy-in from the agency or the organization. And then those commitments at the minimum include attending monthly project meetings, sharing data if, if relevant, and supporting community engagement and outreach. So we do welcome more involvement, but that's kind of, we want to at least have that level of involvement from any project sponsor. Um, so there is a full program overview on the website. If you want to dive into the details, we have some more specifics on what exactly we're looking for, um, as well as the letter of interest is posted. Um, the letters of interest are due October 31st, so we have two months, a little over two months. Um, we would love to talk to any interested um, agencies or organizations before they submit the letter of interest, so feel free to just email me. be happy to talk through and kind of help you scope or think about what might be a good project to submit. And then I, we will um, also host on November 15th a kind of additional informational webinar. So we'd love to have any of you and or your um, colleagues join us to learn more about the project, really dive into the details, um, answer any questions, uh, especially if you are interested in submitting a letter of interest and you're starting to, to look at the letter of interest and, and the different questions, we could kind of talk through some of the details there. So with that, I am happy to take any questions if you have them now, but also hope to talk to folks about projects in the coming weeks. Great. Thank you for the overview. Any questions? Dr. Cog? That was a very thorough presentation. Thank you, Ms. Kern. Thanks. Uh, number, item number eight on your agenda packet will be the statewide program distribution update. This is attachment F in your packet. And I'll hand it over to Mr. Ron Papsdorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations. Probably more coffee out in the hallway if people need to wake up. 
Um, thanks. I just want to take a moment um, at today's meeting to bring everyone up to date on the process of statewide program distribution that's underway at CDOT. Um, this is a process that happens about every four years that CDOT leads, um, principally around a number of um, different transportation funding programs where there's some discretion on how those funds get distributed to different parts of the state, different geographies. So um, this is part of the statewide transportation plan. So CDOT initiates this again about every four years, but usually kind of before they embark on a major statewide plan update. Um, it's how we all sort of project anticipated revenues that will be available for uh, the next period of time to for all of our planning processes. Um, the timing is a little challenging for Dr. Cog, given that we have just completed our TIP process that allocated um, anticipated uh, revenue streams through our TIP process for the year's fiscal year uh, 24 through 27. And this program distribution discussion is also talking about distributing those funds over that same time period. So any adjustments that happen during by the Transportation Commission for some of those discretionary formula programs has uh, potentially some impact over um, our, our TIP over the next uh, four years as well. Um, funding is broken down to a number of these different program areas. Um, some of them have varying levels of discretion at the state level about how, how the funds are distributed to different parts of the state. Usually uh, there's a couple of different geographies at play. It could be distrib distribution among the five CDOT regions. Uh, and we have two of them in the Dr. Cog area. Most, uh, we have all of region one that covers most of the Dr. Cog area and a part of region four that covers the Boulder County and Weld County portions of Dr. Cog. Um, or by transportation planning region, those, these are the 15 geographies around the state that are designated in state statute um, to uh, participate in the statewide transportation planning process. So Dr. Cog is one of those TPRs. I've got a map of those. And some are by, by MPO, the five MPOs in the state. Um, at any rate, uh, there are various uh, formulas that are used to distribute those funds. And then, again, as I stated, Dr. Cog helps, uh, Dr. Cog develops our revenue forecast to inform our regional transportation plan financial um, constraints for a planning period as well as the transportation improvement program. So I mentioned Dr. Cog is one of the 15 transportation planning regions or TPRs around the state. Um, our TPR is coincident with our entire Dr. Cog boundary, which is slightly larger than our Metropolitan Planning Organization boundary. Um, and then you can see the various other uh, TPRs. There's essentially sort of five urban uh, TPRs that uh, align with the five MPOs around the state and then 10 um, kind of more rural TPRs for the rest of the state. Um, we, when, when we're um, participating in this process with our partners around the state and with CDOT, um, you know, we like to remind people that, you know, Dr. Cog's share of the state, if you look at sort of demographics and the economy, is a pretty significant part of the state by population, almost 60% of the total state population is within the Dr. Cog boundary. About 64% of statewide employment uh, is located within uh, this, the Dr. Cog TPR, and we account for a little over 70% of income and wages, state income uh, and wages. So significant part of sort of the demography and the, and the economy. Um, you look at a number of other measures um, and um, it varies quite a bit. So we represent about half of this total statewide vehicle miles of, or, or total trips around the state. Uh, we're about 50% of the vehicle miles traveled on CDOT's uh, state highway system and about, a little, about 54% of the total uh, transportation system um, statewide occurs in the Denver region. Um, when you look at lane miles, um, however, uh, the CDOT lane miles are about 19% located within the Dr. Cog region, about 39% though of the interstate freeway expressway lane miles on the CDOT, CDOT system. So there's a big disparity in the types of facilities that exist within the Dr. Cog region on the statewide system. If you look at the federal aid system, so this includes both the state highway system and those federal aid systems that are located within your local jurisdictions as well, uh, we're a little bit more of that. We're about a quarter of the total uh, statewide federal aid system lane miles um, in, in the state. And then traffic fatalities, unfortunately, about 46%, and then we're about 70% of the total transit trips uh, statewide are located. 
Um, when we look at um, disproportionately impacted communities, which was a big focus of Senate Bill 260 at the state level and trying to urge us all and require us in some cases to consider these issues more directly in our planning and decision-making processes, um, Dr. Cog by far has the greatest number of designated disproportionately impacted communities and people identified under the DIC definition uh, statewide. So over half of all census block groups that are classified in the DIC definition are located within Dr. Cog. The next closest is 12% in the Pikes Peak uh, TPR to our south. Half of all low-income Coloradans reside in Dr. Cog. 60% of all people of color are in Dr. Cog, five times the next closest TPR, and almost 60% of all housing cost burden households um, in the state are located in Dr. Cog. We worked with um, our board and our uh, folks and talked about some principles uh, as we approach and work with our partners around the state in terms of how program distribution should be uh, dealt with, things that should influence the decisions around formulas. They should be based on the purpose and the use of the program. They should include some consideration of where revenue is raised along with system need. Um, at the definition of the system need should consider the purpose and the desired outcomes of the program. And then the data points really should be complete and accurate in terms of those, whatever factors are decided to be used in the formulas, they ought to be as complete and accurate as possible. So for an example, I want to do a little bit of a deeper dive on lane miles. You, you might remember that when you just look at the CDOT system as a whole, about 19% of those lane miles are within the Dr. Cog region. So it's like, oh, well, CDOT, or Dr. Cog has a very small portion of the statewide system if you just look at lane miles, and so we should get less revenue into this region uh, by those formulas. Issue with, the issue with uh, lane miles are, are a couple. Um, the CDOT system uh, that reports that information, OTIS, the Online Transportation Information System, um, only represents through lanes, uh, which is not the entirety of the state highway system. It doesn't include things like freeway ramps or freeway to freeway connectors or frontage roads or auxiliary lanes. And if you think about the system in this Denver region, that's a lot of the system. It also doesn't distinguish between different facility types. So it, a lane mile on an interstate is the same as a lane mile on a local or a rural collector street. Um, there is data available by functional classification, but it historically hasn't been used in these formulas. And then, you know, our belief is that these different facility types really have a different um, kind of level of complexity and need for the transportation resources that are. A couple of quick examples. So this happens to be Federal Boulevard in Denver, just south of I-70. This is about two-tenths of a mile long. It's four lanes wide, so that's 0.8 lane miles. So call it, call it a lane mile for good measure. It's a principal arterial under the state uh, functional classification system. If you look at State Highway 318, you know, west of Maybell in Moffat County in the northwest part of the state, this is a half a mile long. It's two lanes. It's 1.2 lane miles. It's a major collector. So when you just look at lane miles, those two, those two facilities are considered the same in terms of uh, in a formula that uses lane miles of the state highway system or lane miles of the system to allocate uh, funds around the state. We think that's not exactly accurate. Another issue is the, is the completeness of the data, and I talked about sort of those ramps and, and so forth. So this is, this is a screenshot out of the state's um, online transportation information system. This is a section of I-25 uh, just, just north of Bellevue, uh, kind of south of, the, of Interstate 225. Um, in Otis, it shows as nine lanes. Um, there's actually 17 travel lanes in this segment of I-25. Uh, there's seven shoulders. There's barriers. There's lights. There's drains. There's overhead signs. There's markings. It's 290 feet wide. Um, but in Otis, because Otis is limited the way that, and, and, and again, this is not a knock on CDOT. It's just the way the data is presented. Um, it only includes those seven, those nine through lanes, not the entirety of the system. So. You know, it's our belief that we ought to make sure that we're, in court, we're discussing and thinking about the entirety of the data sets when we're talking about very important decisions about how resources get allocated around the state. 
So uh, the process, um, again, uh, these recommendations are sort of these different formula programs are being discussed um, in stages at the statewide transportation advisory committee meeting uh, meetings. Um, they will they're formulating recommendations that ultimately will go to the transportation commission for decision after the first of the year on each of those programs. Um, and then um, we'll take whatever the results of those uh, those conversations, those decisions are, and they will help inform sort of the next update of our 2050 regional transportation plan uh, that will start later next year. Um, so again, these decisions get really important to us collectively in terms of the resources that you anticipate being available in this region uh, to fund important priorities. Um, around the region and including those in the regional transportation plan. And then we'll also have a couple of tip cycles um, as well. Um, the next update, the two-year update um, in the fall of 2024, which is sort of our midterm just refinement of the tip, but then the big um, next call for development of the next four-year tip uh, beginning in the fall of 2025. With that, just again wanted to give an up, up to speed on sort of what that process is, some of the issues that we're raising in our conversations with our partners around the state and with CDOT. Uh, keep you informed. We'll bring more information as there are decisions or recommendations that are formulated um, at the stack level and then obviously before uh, any final decisions are made by the Transportation Commission after the first of the year. Thank you, Mr. Pastorf. Um, any questions? Comments? Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Ron. Um, how are those observations received by CDOT? They seem like they might represent some pretty big changes. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I want to be clear. This, this CDOT's not the enemy here, and and the 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 challenges that I think we face are that. The recommendations are sort of deliberated and, and, and made at the statewide transportation advisory committee level where we are one of 17 seats around that table. And as I mentioned, we're one of five MPOs, sort of five urban TPRs out of 15 uh, total TPRs. So sort of there is often, I think, unfortunately, a little bit of this urban versus rural split. Um, and so that comes to play and we often get and we can get outvoted at that stack table. So that's that's a challenge. Um, unfortunately, I think it's important to note there's not enough money to go around. Right. We're all scrambling for appropriate resources to invest in the transportation systems um, across the entire state. And when those needs and those shortfalls are particularly acute, in a rural part of the state and they see Dr. Cog as a very big part of the state and for good reason, as I tried to point out, like, well, Dr. Cog's got all this money, we need more, so where are we gonna get it from? We need more money um, than, uh, than, you know, than Dr. Cog is getting. And I think what we're trying to point out to our partners around the state is that the needs are everywhere. Right, and at some point, none of us want the rural the rural transportation system to fail because there's plenty of needs there, and they're, they're an important part of the state. At the same time, we can't let the urban part of the system fail either, because all those goods that are either flowing in or out of those rural areas, ultimately most of them come through the Denver region at some point. They're either going to the airport to get shipped out or shipped in, or major rail to truck transfer points are happening in this region and then moving things out or major truck freight movements are flowing through um, the Dr. Cog region to the rest of the state. So the whole system has to work. There's not enough resources to go around. We want the distribution to be fair. Mr. Pilgrim. Uh, thanks, Ron, and in, in, in Madam Chairman, in, in years past, and, and it's been a long time, there was quite an argument, urban, rural, and actually some guide, guidelines or, or a percentage was agreed to um, at, the, at the stack. And I, I think we're long past that now. But, but I noticed uh, in slide five, for example, if you, you're making comparisons, 15 million uh, trips out of 30 million um, and so statistics oriented, um, 
I don't know where I'm going with this, other than uh, at the urban system level, we, we also are trying to do a number of things that are environmentally uh, conscious. We're, there's a sustainability program. There's the, the green uh, the green policies, uh, as well as um, you know, changes to the way we manage our system. Is, is any of that considered in terms of future criteria in balancing? Uh, and and for that matter, has CDOT come forward with a here's a possible way, or we're going to stay with what we've done in the past? Um, I think the, the simple answer to your question is, Rick, no, those other factors haven't come up that I've heard um, kind of been raised by anyone in terms of some of the formulas um, and the factors considered in those formulas. I it, it is more about sort of the transportation system and the transportation demand. I mean, I think those are the traditional factors that are mostly considered. And, you know, you look at this slide and so you know, when the rural parts of the state believe they need more resources, and I'm not saying they don't need more resources, we all do, they, I think there is generally a, a, an incentive to focus on those factors that are more advantageous. So lane miles becomes a big push. The rural parts of the state, we've got lots more, look, we have lots more lane miles. The Denver region only has 20% of the state highway system lane miles. So why should, why should the Denver region get, I mean, they're not saying 20% of the funds, but you know, a, a formula that sort of emphasizes that over things like population or vehicle miles traveled or trips or transit trips um, isn't in their interest focusing on thing like, things like lane miles, which is why we're trying to provide a little bit more of a balanced view of lane miles and differentiating between different facility types um, to help inform that or think about other factors that um, more accurately sort of um, define what the extent of the need of the transportation system is. Oh, a follow-up here. Um, did, I, did I miss the timing for how this goes forward? Um, yeah, I did hit, I did throw a little bit of a schedule up there, Rick. So. Um, the stack is working through the various formulas sort of in sequence over time. So they've gone through a couple of those already. Um, once stack has completed their process and formulated recommendations on all of those formulas around, around the end of this year, then um, CDOT anticipates taking a package of all of the recommendations to the Transportation Commission uh, for action um, early in 2024. And, and would this be a Dr. Cog board uh, proposal that goes forward? No, so recommenda recommendations, uh, so the Transportation Commission makes the decisions on these programs that have some discretion about how the formulas are developed and how those funds are allocated by different formulas. Um, so recommendations to the Transportation Commission are happening at the stack level. Now, depending on what those recommendations are and depending on how our board feels about those recommendations, uh, we may bring some uh, decision packages forward to our board in order for them to weigh in to the Transportation Commission as they uh, deliberate on their final decision. Sorry, uh, do you sense any interest on the part of the board of no. Our share should be this. Yes. There you go. <laughs> I think the board shares the view that they that they believe that the Denver region should get, you know, an equitable share of the resources, considering again, there's not enough money statewide. We know everyone needs more resources, but when you're distributing sort of limited resources, there ought to be some some equitable as much as possible distribution of those resources based on a fair assessment of the criteria. Not, the board hasn't settled on any, we need this percentage of resources, right? I think that's not quite the appropriate. Any additional comments, questions for Mr. Papstorf or Dr. Cox? 
Great. Thank you, Mr. Papstorf. Thank you for keeping the TAC informed of these conversations going on with TAC and TC and um, tracking this information for the Dr. Cog Board. Um, administrative items. Um, item number nine, um, member comments or other matters. Advanced Mobility Partnership Working Group update. Um, Reese, do you have an update for us? No update this month, Madam Chair. That was nice and short. Uh, <laughs> uh, any additional comments, uh, Mr. Rieger? Yeah, a couple things. Um, AMP is not my lane, but I will know because I was at it that the AMP Executive Committee did meet this morning and it was a really good meeting. Um, a lot of uh, really important topics. So um, there has been AMP activity through the Executive Committee meeting this morning. Um, main thing I wanted to talk about though is because this is our second to last meeting of the year, uh, we actually need to, at our next meeting, our last meeting of the year, um, elect new officers for the coming two years. Um, so recall that per our Dr. Cog Committee guidelines, we do elect chair and vice chair every two years. Uh, we do that in odd numbered years. So here we are in the end of 2023. So we will do that at our December 4th meeting that I talked about at the beginning of, of this meeting. In the interim though, we do need to take a couple steps. Um, first is that I will in the next few days or so send out a solicitation to Dr. Cog, or Dr. Cog, um, to TAC uh, members um, soliciting candidates for chair and vice chair. Uh, so I will do that kind of directly and, and hopefully generate some interest. At the same time, we also typically form uh, what we call a nominating committee or nominating panel to kind of help me through that process. The main job of the nominating committee is to either um, kind of help vet the candidates that we get in or as needed, uh, maybe kind of drum up some candidates. Like if no one say applies for vice chair, maybe we contact some folks and try and drum up some interest in, in candidacies for those positions. And then typically the nominating committee works together to kind of bring forward a slate of kind of recommended chair and vice chair candidates. Um, though we will also take nominations from the floor um, at the December 4th meeting. So it's not a lot of work. In fact, we typically have not had to meet formally as a committee. We typically just do the work over email. Um, but I will ask for a few volunteers um, to serve on the nominating committee to kind of help me through um, the election process over the next few weeks. So if there are any volunteers now, I'll certainly take that now. Um, otherwise, I will make that part of the solicitation. We'll ask folks to either, um, you know, of course, if you're considering running for chair or vice chair, or if you're interested in being on the nominating committee. Um, so I will put people on the spot and ask, is there any interest in anyone serving on the nominating committee to help us through the election process? Thank, thank you. Great, who else? All right, that is a good start. Um, <laughs> Rick, you've done it at least the last two times. I didn't want to put you on the spot, but if you'd like to do it one more time, we'd love to have your. I'll do it. Okay, so I have Frank Bruno, David Krutzinger, Brody Ayers, and Bill Saroy. Well, all right, I appreciate that very much. I will be in contact with you four um, kind of separately, but uh, very much appreciate you volunteering. Madam Chair. Mr. Rieger, thank you for the volunteers. Um, any additional comments uh, or updates from other members? Okay. Well, seeing none, our next meeting will be Monday, December 4th, and that will be the last meeting of the year. Uh, Mr. Kennedy will be sending out updates for our calendars. And if you did not sign in, please do check in at the sign-in table um, or check in with Mr. Kennedy to be sure that you're marked as attending. And we will see you Monday, December 4th, and we are now adjourned at 3.05. Thank you.